Well, the rest of the sermon should go swimmingly now, right? We can only hope and pray. I was going to say, this month I'm happy to be able to be here with you and commemorate uh, 30 years of ministry in the Religious Liberty Department. And I was remembering that the first time that I was here at Camelback was, I want to say 1996, we did a weekend program and we had Dan Matthews as our special uh, speaker for that weekend. I'm just curious, are there any members who've been here that long who even remember that? I see a hand, a couple of hands. So I'm getting a huge echo. Is that just me? You guys okay? You've got an echo. So we've got to fix the echo. Is that better? I don't think I'm hearing the echo anymore. We're good. We're good. You know the old saying, to err is human, but to really mess things up, it takes a computer, technology, you know, <laughs> fill in the blank. All right, well... You know, our day job, we're helping people with religious discrimination uh, issues like Sabbath accommodation. And so we brought some brochures, our church day council brochures, if you're interested, they're in the back along with our Christian nationalism brochures. But, um, you know, things get pretty hectic sometimes. And I didn't actually get to write the sermon that is uh, the title that's in your bulletin. But never fear, we'll come back in the fall and by then hopefully we'll have uh, the sermon about living in the image of the beast. Meanwhile, if I can figure out how the clicker works. Okay, come on. I turned it on. Green, right? Green. Okay. No, no, that says it's off. Maybe that's on. Okay, there we go. All right, this was human error this time. <laughs> what is Christian about Christian America? So I wanted to start with this slide, which comes from the masthead of the church's Religious Liberty Magazine. Liberty Magazine, we, we take up an offering every year to send the magazine out to the leaders in our communities. And we've been publishing it under the title of Liberty since 1906. So these principles are who we are as Seventh-day Adventists, and I especially want to call your attention to the notion there at the top that the God-given right of religious liberty is best exercised when church and state are separate. Now, there's a bill in the legislature here in Arizona going through that challenges our notion of what is church-state separation. It's a bill to post the Ten Commandments on the walls of public schools. Now, why is that a problem? Well, whose Ten Commandments are we going to post? You, the Jewish version and the Catholic version and the Protestant version are all different. So someone's going to have to make some sort of decision. Do we want our elected officials deciding which is the best or correct version of... Now, I mean, this is an Adventist church. We believe in the Ten Commandments. We take them seriously, don't we? We take them so seriously that we don't want government officials telling us what the commandments are, right? So... I, I thought I would get to meddling because, you know, Arizona is, is, a, very, is a state that is very much pro-gun. And, you know, the Sixth Commandment, there is some theological debate about the best translation of the phrase, is it thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder? 
Well, some might prefer that we teach our kids thou shalt not murder. Do we want the government officials uh, resolving that uh, theological dispute? I don't think so. We want the separation of church and state. And after all, the Ten Commandments really don't need to be on the wall as much as they need to be where? In the heart, right? And, you know, I was discussing this with my wife, and, and, and she used to teach English, and she said, well, we studied the Ten Commandments. I said, yes. It's perfectly appropriate to teach the Bible in literature and, and various, as part of various curriculum, to teach objectively about it. It's different when you put it up on the wall, then w the, and, and you leave it up all year long, you are essentially having the government endorse, well, one of these versions, either a Jewish faith or a Catholic faith or Protestant faith. And it's very clear from the sponsor of the bill what he had in mind. And uh, he gave an interview which was reported in the paper and he said, because America is such a diverse nation, it is because of the Christian religion that we have allowed their religions to come in and be known. Because of the Christian religion and its foundation in this nation is the reason why we have other religions in this nation. Now, do you see a little bit of this us and them here? And, and the notion that America belongs to who? To Christians. And others, they're allowed. Well, if you're just allowed, maybe you're just tolerated, that's not true freedom, is it? Well, we're gonna return to this theme in a bit. But I want to put it in the context of Scripture here in Revelation chapter 13 where Seventh-day Adventists believe that this passage describes the role of the United States. And I don't have time to expand on that this morning. I saw another beast coming up from the earth having two horns like a lamb speaking as a dragon exercising all the authority of the first beast in its presence and making the earth and those who inhabit it worship the first beast whose lethal wound had been healed. Two horns. We're going to start there. Horns, a symbol of power. Two horns indicate a separation of power. Now horns, the horns are, are, are on the lamb. So the nation is lamb-like or, well, the lamb is a symbol of, okay, are you listening? <laughs> hello. You know, in the black church we say, hello walls, right? Are you listening? The lamb in the Bible is a symbol of Christ. So there's something uniquely Christ-like here having a separation of powers. In prophecy, uh, if you've studied the book of Daniel, you know that there's a, a significant power symbolized by a single little horn combining civil and religious authority, combining church and state. Here we have a separation. Separation of powers, we see it in all of our political life, uh, you have the courts, you have the legislature, you have the executive branch, you have a separation between uh, federal, state, and local government as well, right? Separation of powers, separation of church and state, neither one of those phrases is in the Constitution. That's not what the Constitution says, it's what the Constitution does, right? And all in the purpose and goal of protecting civil and religious freedom, right? So that is what truly makes America unique and great, is our system to protect our freedoms, right? That's what we, what we celebrate. Now, if we're 
you know, honest, that has always been somewhat aspirational, right? We have these values, these, these principles that being human, we don't live up to. And, and that's where the dragon speaking comes in, but we'll get there in a, in, in a minute. So I wanna take you back to the principles as they were uh, th uh, announced and, and written about from our founding fathers. And in colonial America, there was a very prominent rejection of both bishops and kings. They didn't want a king over the nation. They didn't want a bishop over the church. They wanted freedom for church and state. They were rejecting tyranny on both fronts. So, Thomas Jefferson drafted this the same year that the Declaration of Independence was issued. It was a decade later before James Madison secured its passage in uh, the legislature in Virginia. Wonderful statement. Uh, the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. Whereas Almighty God hath created the mind free. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Right? This is... This is who we are as Americans. And, and notice what he goes on to say here. All attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens, and what are those? Laws he's talking about, right? Punishments, civil incapacitations tend only to beget habits of hypocrisy and meanness. If you're, you know, they had Sunday laws back then, right? And if you are... Uh, forced to go to church on Sunday because you're having to obey the law, then what are you? You're a hypocrite. You're not going to worship God. You're going because you don't want to get fined, right? Uh, and he says they are a departure from the plan of the holy author of our religion, who being Lord both of body and mind, yet chose not to propagate it by coercions on either, as being he had the almighty power to do. You get the gist of this? You know, God has almighty power. He doesn't coerce our conscience, neither should the state, right? That the impious presumption of legislators and rulers, and notice he's not just singling out politicians, he's singling out priesthood as well. Civil as well as ecclesiastical, who being themselves but fallible and uninspired men have assumed dominion over the faith of others, setting up their own opinions and modes of thinking as the only true and infallible, and as such endeavoring to impose them on others. And the result, he says, they have established and maintained false religions over the greatest part of the world and through all time. That is a Protestant view of Western history, friends. Very very clear that the notion of merging church and state and giving legislators and priests together the power to determine our uh, beliefs and our opinions and control our worship, uh, he calls that uh, dominion which has produced false religion. Very, very clear. James Madison if you read one document in your entire life about religious liberty, it should be this one, Madison's Memorial and Remonstrance. We hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion, which he defines as the duty we owe our creator. It's a pretty good definition, right? And the manner of discharging it can be directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. You agree with that? Yes. The religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man, and it is the right of every man to exercise it as these may dictate. And you see that word exercise, which wound up in our First Amendment, right? The free exercise of religion. These are the principles that our nation was founded upon. And of course, Madison is uh, responsible for this famous observation that it is proper to take alarm at the first experiment on our liberties. He says, well, who doesn't see the same authority which can establish Christianity in exclusion of all other religions may establish with the same ease any particular 
sect of Christians in exclusion of all others, which is the problem with one of the problems with the Ten Commandments bill, right? Because you're going to choose one version, one group's version over others, right? And if they can uh, force you to contribute uh, three pennies of, of taxes, uh, property taxes to support somebody's religion, they can force you to conform to any other establishment as well. So, I think I made my point. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here. But these are the principles, the, the, the separation of church and state, the free exercise of religion. These are fundamental principles of religious freedom, and, and it's part of who we are as, as Adventists to advocate for these. Now, you know, uh, there's so much talk these days about how America was intentionally created by our founding fathers to be a Christian nation. Well, at best, we have been a, a, a nation of Christians, but we have never been a Christian nation. Uh, the very first official document of our nation to weigh in on this topic was this treaty that was negotiated by the administration of George Washington, our first president, and then ratified after Washington left office under the administration of his successor, John Adams. Now, uh, before we had a navy, our merchant vessels were subject to attack in, in the Mediterranean by the Barbary pirates from Tripoli. So they were Muslim. And uh, they assumed that, you know, being essentially European, that we were their enemies and they would have their way with our merchant vessels, uh, which were at that time defenseless, but that gave rise to the building of the American Navy. Well, we entered this treaty in 1796, and one of the articles that was significant, of course they all are, is this declaration that the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. It wasn't. And as a result, there's no enmity against the law's religion or tranquility of a Muslim community like, uh, like Tripoli, right? Because we're not favoring one religion over another, and in fact, um, many of our founders specifically contemplated religious freedom to include not just Catholics, which was shocking, not just Jews, but Muslims as well. That was uh, very much thought about and written about. Now, Madison also agreed with Jefferson's assessment of uh, the travesty of uh, Christian history in terms of religious freedom. He's, he looks back on history, and he says, experience witnesses that ecclesiastical establishments, you know, the bringing together of church and state, instead of maintaining the purity and the efficacy of religion, they've had a contrary operation. During almost 15 centuries, what, what you and I would, would think of as the Dark Ages, he says, has the legal establishment of Christianity been on trial? What have been its fruits? More or less in all places, pride and indolence in the clergy, ignorance and servility in the laity in both superstition, bigotry, and persecution. Our reading of the book of Revelation comes to the same conclusion, doesn't it? That the period when church and state were united, we, the 1260 years, were a dark time for the faith. And that, in fact, the woman, the pure church, was uh, protected in the wilderness during that time, right? Now, this uniting of church and state goes back to the time of Constantine, right? Constantine completely altered the relationship between the church and the imperial government uh, so that by the end of the fourth century, Christianity had been transformed from a persecuted sect 
to the dominant faith of the empire and in the process becoming intertwined with the imperial government. And ultimately, the, uh, the church dominated the government, not the other way around. So, the lamb-like principles, what is Christian about Christian America is our commitment to civil and religious freedom, our learning the lessons of history about the dangers of bringing church and state together. But now let's take a look at the other side, because it says that we have two horns like a lamb, but we speak as a dragon. And uh, although we commonly as Adventists think of, you know, the lamb as our past or even our present and the dragon as somehow future, in the text, lamb and dragon are all together at the same time. It's an imperfect uh, tense. So from the beginning, we've had this tension between our Christ-like aspirations and principles and our dragon-like conduct. Uh, you only need to look at the document of the Constitution itself, which specifies that those whose skin color is not white would be three-fifths of a person, or at least counted as such for purposes of uh, allocating uh, representatives in the, in, in the House of Representatives, right? So, no, there were uh, problems. There was the dragon at work from the very beginning. <coughs> and too many examples. But I will point out that the Adventist understanding of, of the dragon goes back to the very beginnings of our religious liberty ministry when none other than A.T. Jones, very famous, really founder of our religious liberty ministry, uh, he would preach about how uh, American imperialism against Spain was evidence of dragon speaking. And of course, the early Adventists were uh, abolitionists and not only spoke out, but, but uh, were uh, uh, against slavery, but were active in the Underground Railroad. Now, I want to take this in a little different direction because many Americans have a sense of impending doom about the direction that our nation is going. And on both the left and the right, there are you know, people sounding off about the dangers to our democracy. Well, the Jewish community has a unique perspective on this. Uh, and in fact, and at least in my view, Jews are something like the canary in the coal mine for uh, our, uh, our principles and our democracy. There, the cover uh, article, very long article in The Atlantic in this month, uh, next month's uh, April Atlantic, is this article entitled, The Golden Age of American Jews is Ending. And the subtext says, anti-Semitism on the right and the left threatens to bring to a close an unprecedented period of safety and prosperity for Jewish Americans and demolish the liberal order they helped establish. Now, before you start thinking that, you know, liberal is a dirty word, most conservatives believe in what here is being referred to as the liberal order. But the point is, America has been a place where Jews have felt safe for a very long time. But in the last couple of years, what we have been hearing and seeing um, both publicly, privately in synagogues, publicly in, in publications, is more and more Jews asking the question, is it time to leave? Is America no longer safe? And particularly after the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th, America has become an unsafe place for many, many Jews. And uh, when they are polled, many, uh, a high percentage of Jews no longer feel safe in America. Now, Lest you and I say to ourselves, well, you know, we're Adventists. Why does that have anything to do with us? Understand 
something about the great controversy. Uh, our Sabbath school quarterly is about the great controversy. Well, the great controversy is about Satan's hostility against God, fighting against God, and seeking to destroy God's people. And the history of the Jews is the history of, God's, of Satan's enmity against God and against his people. Adventists expect that that enmity will one day be turned upon us, right? But it's always been turned upon the Jews. They've always, well, we've always been the scapegoats. We've always been the ones blamed for everything. We've always been the ones ostracized, persecuted, uh, and deprived of our rights. But what is Christian about Christian America has made America a safe place for Jews. And yet, too many of us are now wondering if we're still safe. And it's not just wondering, because if, if, if you look into some of the stories of anti-Semitism, our public schools, our high schools, our colleges and universities, I mean, to have professor, uh, have the presidents of some of our top universities testify at Congress and say that calling for uh, the uh, Holocaust, uh, not the Holocaust, the uh, ethnic, forgetting the term. Say it again. Well, okay, that, but, but calling for uh, the annihilation of the Jews may be okay in context, right? What context is there? For a genocide is the term that I was struggling with. You know, that, that uh, fr free speech principles might protect students publicly calling for the genocide of, of Israel and of the Jewish people? Is there ever a time when it's okay to call for genocide? And, and the confusion on the left is what is so astounding uh, because, you know, the J Jewish community and the African American community, the liberals have, all, have been united and, and working for civil rights for decades. But to have the, the progressive left turn on the Jewish community is really startling. One of my colleagues who's very active, who's Jewish woman, very active in women's issues said that despite the unspeakable horrors inflicted upon Jewish women on October 7th, things that I cannot mention in church, the women's rights movement in America had nothing to say. The civil rights community in America had nothing to say because this liberal ideology that portrays Israel as the neo-colonial oppressor has so taken over that people can't see clearly. You know, I guess our sense of history is very, very narrow because in the scheme of the last millennium, uh, it is the Islamic world that has been the colonial oppressor throughout the Middle East for centuries, right? To the point where the Jewish community has been ethnically cleansed from almost all of the Arab countries. Well, so there's plenty of intolerance on the left, but my point is, the rise of anti-Semitism, this is the canary in the coal mine of the collapse of what is Christian about Christian America, the collapse of our principles that everyone is equal in the eyes of the law. As, as the author explains it, over the course of the 20th century, Jews invested their faith in a distinct strain of liberalism that combined robust civil liberties, protection of minority rights, and ethos of cultural pluralism, right? We're all Americans. They embraced this brand of liberalism because it was good for America and good for the Jews. It was their fervent hope 
that liberalism would inoculate America against the world's oldest hatred. But unfortunately, anti-Semitism is back with a vengeance. Now, intolerance on the left, intolerance on the, uh, on the right. We started with a very good example of Christian nationalism, the idea that America belongs to us Christians. And everybody else there, you know, we allowed them here. It's not their country. Christianity today defines Christian nationalism as the belief that the American nation is defined by Christianity and the government should take active steps to keep it that way. Popularly, Christian nationalists assert that America is and must remain a Christian nation, not merely as an observation about American history, but as a prescriptive program for what America must continue to be in the future. Well, a more theological approach is from the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary, and you know that Adventists share a theological heritage with the Radical Reformation, uh, with the Anabaptists and with the Mennonites. And I think they quite accurately say Christian nationalism is a form of political idolatry that distorts our knowledge of God and neighbor through a xenophobic, racialized, and militarized gospel that is at odds with the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, most of us who tend to be conservative or vote conservative and, you know, have many Christian values and, and, and all. We, we have a lot in common with uh, Christian nationalism, but we overlook what is driving this whole movement and what's at the heart of the political movement is a global apostasy that most of us have never heard about. In fact, most pastors I talk to and church leaders are dimly aware because we Adventists, we kind of live within our own circle, within our own bubble. The New Apostolic Reformation has chapters in at least 46 countries and boasts some of the most successful megachurch pastors in the world. It is a movement within Pentecostalism that even Pentecostalism rejects. It has hundreds and hundreds of self-proclaimed apostles, tens of thousands of prophets, at least they claim to be, uh, they, and their focus is their belief in supernatural signs and wonders, which they claim to be performing regularly, their emphasis on spiritual warfare, their theology of dominionism. The apostles believe that God has chosen them to lead spiritual warfare, to lead God's people in warfare, to take over the world, to establish the kingdom of God here and now. And they are the generals, and they, their uh, connection to the Holy Spirit is extra-biblical, it's not grounded in scripture, it's very idiosyncratic. Uh, the theology of dominion, to exercise dominion in every aspect of life, right? Now, as I was looking into the New Apostolic Reformation, I made a connection with something that Jesus said. It really startled me the connection to what Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus describes the apostasy of the last days. Do you see? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, on what day? What day is he talking about? He's talking about Judgment Day, right? Now, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, are you going to be telling him about how holy you are 
and about all the things that you, wonderful things you've done in Jesus' name? Is that going to be your claim to salvation? When I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I am claiming the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ alone. You know, I used to have an argument with my Jewish mother. You know that you never win an argument with a Jewish mother, don't you? <laughs> and and I, I suspect that some of you from other cultural backgrounds may say the same thing about mothers in your cultures too, right? We're not unique in that way. But she, would, she got to be kind of new age later in life and, and, and she would talk to me about karma. You know, karma, you, you know, it goes around, comes around, and, you know, whatever you put out into the universe comes back to you. So, you know, I would say to her, well, with karma, you get exactly what you deserve. And I'd say, well, I, I, I'm not interested in karma. I get grace. Because with grace, I get much better than I deserve. Amen. Right? We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And the answer that we have for him on that day is not, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? It's not about us. But notice what these folks who are clearly on the wrong track, they don't understand the gospel, notice what they are professing to be involved in. Prophecy, they're prophets and apostles, they're engaged in spiritual warfare, they're casting out demons, and they're doing miracles. The very things that are emphasized by the new apostolic reformation which is sweeping the world. It is a global apostasy and it's at the heart of Christian nationalism. It's at the heart of transforming the nation for Christ into a you know Christian legal system really. You know Christians talk about not wanting Sharia law I don't want Sharia law. I don't want uh, Christians telling me what they think the law should be either, right? This is a nation where all of us have to learn to live together in peace. Now, the notion that there is a problem within the Christian community here in America today is widespread and widely understood by some of the most thoughtful and prominent Christian leaders. You may not know this gentleman, but Russell Moore is none other than the editor of Christianity Today. So uh, that makes him a rather mainstream Christian. He recently left uh, leadership within the Southern Baptist Convention because of various uh, disputes and problems within that community. But Russell Moore published a book last year called Losing Our Religion, an Altar Call for Evangelical America, and it's got a double meaning. Because on the one hand, Russell Moore is saying that we're, we're losing our religion, we're losing our grip on the gospel. On the other hand, what he's also saying is the religion we got, we need to lose. Now, when he was being interviewed about why he wrote this book, he said what inspired him was that many pastors were coming up to him and crying on his shoulder that when they would reference the Sermon on the Mount in a sermon, parenthetically, you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, or, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, something like that, that church members would come up to them afterwards and say, where'd you get those liberal talking points? <laughs> and when the pastor would remind the church member that this was, after all, the, the words of Jesus, instead of, you know, backing down or being apologetic, the church member would say something like, well, that's weak. 
You know, we don't need that anymore. And that's when he realized that we've completely lost our way. The American church is really in trouble, folks. Now, this whole notion of establishing the kingdom of God as an earthly dominion, this should have no appeal for us as Adventists because we remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream, don't we? We remember how Daniel describes the succession of four world empires and how at the end of that, a stone cut out without human hand will destroy and smash all earthly kingdoms and establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. A stone cut out without human hand, it says, right? Without any help from us, God will establish his kingdom in his own time. Amen? Amen. Now, I changed the scripture reading to this one because I think that it's really important for us to see what's happening within our political uh, life as a nation in the context of Jesus' teaching about what really is the goals and the attitudes of an authentic faith community. It's not about grasping for power. It's not about conforming the laws to what we think they should be to our faith principles. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, Jesus says, uh, in the light of two of his disciples wanting political power. They want Jesus to sit on his throne and they want to be sitting right next to him on the right and the left, right? And Jesus says, uh-uh, it ain't going to come down like that, right? You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. That's not the way it's going to be for you. It shall not be so among you. You're not going to exercise authority. Whoever would be great among you must be what? The church is not called to exercise authority. We are called to serve. That could not be more clear. Society at large is always in need of moral and spiritual uplift. It's never going to completely conform to the will of God. And our role as the church is to be the church, to be the servant, to provide that moral and spiritual uplift, not by exercising authority, but by our loving service. Is that clear? As if the teachings of Jesus weren't clear enough before his crucifixion, he was unable to change their attitude even after he was just about to be uh, raised up to heaven. Acts chapter 1, here, here he is, right about to be sent up to heaven, and his disciples are still wanting to sit on the right and the left hand, right? Right? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. The authority to rule belongs to the Father, and he will establish his kingdom in his own time. Jesus says, but you will receive not the exousia, the authority to rule, you will receive dunamis, the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the uttermost ends of the earth. The exousia, the, the authority to rule, belongs to the Father. We have something else, something better, something suited for us. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 
And this is the only power that God has ever delegated to the church, and the only power that we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses. So I'm going to close with this reminder. Because we Adventists say we believe the three angels' messages, but I don't think many of us really understand them very well. Now, the first angel's message went forth at a time in the 19th century when the Enlightenment world was all gaga over Darwin and an excuse to throw out the creator God because after all, evolution, right? In the, in the 1840s, 1850s, evolution was all the rage. And the message came down, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and reverence him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. Return to the worship of the creator. That was present truth. And it's been present truth ever since. Present truth today is the message of the second angel that Babylon has fallen. Now, Babylon is a symbol in Scripture of the woman riding on the beast. The church having become a harlot, corrupt in apostasy. And the thing that leads her into apostasy, according to this, is because of her relationship with the state. Because she made all nations do something. Church and state together in what's described as fornication. What is fornication? It is an immoral, intimate relationship, right? Church and state in too close a uh, relationship, she makes all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Scripture, the wine, is a symbol of the gospel. Jesus says the wine, the gospel cannot be contained in old wineskins. Israel, and I think the pastor, when he does his series, is going to touch on, is going to really get into this. The gospel could not be contained within the national structure that uh, God had worked through for a long time with the nation of Israel, right? It was going to explode and become universal and worldwide, no longer restricted to the nation of Israel. New wineskins for the gospel, but here we have a false gospel being enforced, that's where the wrath comes in, being enforced through the power of the state. You have the church relying not on the power of the Holy Spirit, but relying on the power of the state. Is that clear? That's the second angel's message. And this is a message that is present truth for what we're seeing in our nation and in our world today. Because this notion of Christian nationalism is not restricted to the United States. It has implications in many other parts of the world as well. And maybe we'll get into that um, in another sermon. If we are going to be faithful as Seventh-day Adventists, this is our message right here, is this warning that America loses her way, her Christian values, if you will, when we unite church and state. And when we make religion something that we want to enforce by law. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the principles, the Christian principles of the two horns like a lamb that this nation was founded upon. Thank you for the privilege of understanding these messages these prophetic insights for today. But Lord, here we are in the face of all this, and, and who are we? Who are we to somehow convey these messages to our community? And yet, with Isaiah, 
we confess to you, here am I, send me. We want to be used by you, Lord. I know each and every one hearing my voice wants to be faithful in serving you. Lord, help us to understand these things. Help us to know how it can shape our life and our ministry. And, and Lord, I want to pray that, that we would fully support Pastor John in the series coming up because I know he's going to be dealing with some very urgent topics. And, and I pray that you would even now send your spirit to, to, bring, to bring conviction to people who don't know much about you and to, to others who, who may know you but may not understand. I pray that you would go forth and, and help us to go forth and be faithful to, to invite people. And, and Lord, I would be remiss if I did not invite anyone hearing my voice who, who may have wandered from Christ, or maybe you've never really known him. Maybe you've been distant. Maybe you've wondered. Just to, to say yes to Jesus today, to invite him into your heart to say, I want to serve you. I want to know you, Jesus. And I need you in my life. You don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to come down front. This is not about me or showing me that you want to know Jesus. It's between you and him. Jesus is not going to drag anybody kicking and screaming into the kingdom. We all have a choice to make, and I pray that if there are some who have been indecisive, who've been holding out on Jesus, may we surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.